Marxism and the Oppression of Women Part 1. Socialist Feminism Chapter 2. A Decade of Debate Socialist feminist theory, like the movement to which it owes its existence, is far from monolithic. In general, socialist feminists argue that socialist theory must be extended or even entirely transformed by means of the insights offered by feminist theory and practice. A variety of attempts to execute this transformation has been made, although no consensus yet exists on their adequacy. If anything, socialist feminists increasingly recognize the difficulty of the theoretical task. We have been excessively impatient for finished products, answers, and total theories, comments one group. We have not allowed for the tremendous amount of work involved in clearing new paths and dealing with new questions. End quote from Red Apple Collective. Nonetheless, more than 10 years of theoretical efforts in the name of socialist feminism have left their mark. Despite weaknesses, which sometimes function as obstacles to further progress, the socialist feminist movement has made the most important advances in the development of socialist theory on the question of women since the 19th century. Initial efforts to develop a socialist feminist theoretical perspective focused on the family unit and the labor of housework and child-rearing in contemporary capitalist societies. The opening argument, an article entitled Women, the Longest Revolution, by Juliet Mitchell, actually appeared well before the development of the socialist feminist movement proper. First printed in 1966 in New Left Review, a British Marxist journal, Mitchell's piece began to circulate widely in the United States two years later. It rapidly became a major theoretical influence on the emerging socialist feminist trend within the women's liberation movement. The publication in 1971 of Mitchell's book, Woman's Estate, based on the earlier article, reinforced the impact of Mitchell's ideas. Mitchell begins Women, the Longest Revolution with an intelligent critique of the classical Marxist literature on the question of women. She comments briefly on the schematic views of women's liberation held by Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, Auguste Bebel, and Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, locating their inadequacies in the absence of an appropriate strategic context. In these texts, quote, the liberation of women remains a normative ideal, an adjunct to socialist theory, not structurally integrated into it. Even Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, while an important contribution, is limited by its attempt to meld, quote, idealist psychological explanation with an orthodox economist approach. In sum, quote, the classical literature on the problem of women's condition is predominantly economist in emphasis, end quote. For Mitchell, the way out of the impasse is to differentiate women's condition into four separate structures production, reproduction, socialization, and sexuality. Each structure develops separately and requires its own analysis. Together, they form the, quote, complex unity of woman's position. Under production, Mitchell includes various activities external to what we might intuitively call the domestic or family sphere. For example, participation in wage labor in capitalist society. Conversely, the three remaining categories, oppressively united in the institution known as the family, encompass woman's existence outside of production, as wife and mother. In an effort to reach general strategic conclusions, Mitchell then surveys the current state of each of the four structures. Production, reproduction, and socialization show little dynamism, she says, and indeed have not for years. The structure of sexuality, by contrast, is currently undergoing severe strain and represents the strategic weak link, that is, the structure most vulnerable to immediate attack. While one structure may be the weak link, Mitchell argues that socialist strategy will have to confront all four structures of women's position in the long run. Furthermore, quote, economic demands are still primary in the last instance. In this context, Mitchell makes a number of sensitive strategic observations. The left must reject both reformism and voluntarism on the issue of women's oppression, for they always lead to inadequate strategic programs. The reformist tendency 
manifests itself as a set of modest ameliorative demands, divorced from any fundamental critique of women's position. The voluntarist approach takes the more belligerent form of maximalist demands concerning the abolition of the family, total sexual freedom, collective child-rearing, and the like. Although these demands appear radical, they, quote, merely serve as a substitute for the job of theoretical analysis or practical persuasion. By pitching the whole subject in totally intransigent terms, voluntarism objectively helps to maintain it outside the framework of normal political discussion, end quote. In place of such abstract programs, the socialist movement requires a practical set of demands that address all four structures of women's position. For instance, in the area of wage labor, Mitchell observes that, quote, the most elementary demand is not the right to work or receive equal pay for work, the two traditional reformist demands, but the right to equal work itself, end quote. As for the abolition of the family, the strategic concern should rather be the liberation of women and the equality of the sexes. The consequences of this concern are, quote, no less radical, but they are concrete and positive and can be integrated into the real course of history. The family as it exists at present is, in fact, incompatible with either women's liberation or the equality of the sexes. But equality will not come from its administrative abolition, but from the historical differentiation of its functions. The revolutionary demand should be for the liberation of these functions from an oppressive monolithic fusion. End quote. Questions about Mitchell's analysis of woman's situation arise in four areas. First, the discussion of the empirical state of the separate structures is extremely weak, a failure that has, or should have, consequences in the realm of strategy. To maintain that production, reproduction, and socialization are all more or less stationary in the West today, and that they have not changed for three or more decades, grossly misrepresents not only post-war history, but the evolution of 20th century capitalism. Moreover, as Mitchell herself sometimes recognizes, the contradictions produced by rapid movement in all four of her structures form the very context for the emergence of the women's liberation movement. A generally inadequate historical vision accompanies Mitchell's failure to identify contemporary changes in the structures, and her work reveals, overall, a certain disregard for concrete analysis. Second, Mitchell's view of women's relationship to production is open to serious criticism. She presents production as a structure from which women have been barred since the beginning of class society. Even capitalism has ameliorated this situation but little, for it perpetuates, quote, the exclusion of women from production, social human activity. Like all previous forms of social organization, capitalist society constitutes the family as Quote, a triptych of sexual, reproductive, and socializatory functions, the woman's world, embraced by production, the man's world, end quote. In sum, Mitchell views production as an aspect of experience essentially external to women. Once again, she misreads history, for women's participation in production has been a central element of many class societies. Furthermore, Mitchell persistently devalues women's domestic labor as well, and gives it no clear theoretical status. A third problem in Mitchell's analysis is her treatment of the family. While she mentions the family at every point, Mitchell denies the category family any explicit theoretical presence. Its place is taken by the triptych of structures that make up the woman's world, reproduction, socialization, and sexuality. At the same time, the actual content of these three structures has a severe arbitrariness, and Mitchell fails to establish clear lines of demarcation among them. Women are seen as imprisoned in their, quote, confinement to a monolithic condensation of functions in a unity, the family. But that unity has itself no articulated analytical existence. Finally, Mitchell's manner of establishing a structural framework to analyze the problem of women's oppression requires critical examination. The four structures that make up the complex unity of woman's position operate at a level of abstraction that renders social analysis almost impossible. 
they provide a universal grid on which women, and implicitly the family, can be located, irrespective of mode of production or class position. Societal variation and class struggle appear, if at all, as afterthoughts, rather than central determinants. Furthermore, the manner in which the four structures combine to produce a complex unity remains largely unspecified, as well as abstract and ahistorical. As a result, Mitchell's theoretical approach resembles the functionalism of bourgeois social science, which posits quite similar models of complex interaction among variables. Indeed, the content of her four structures also derives from functionalist hypotheses, specifically those of George Murdoch. Despite her staunchly Marxist intentions, then, Mitchell's theoretical perspective proves inadequate to sustain her analysis. Footnote. Murdoch argued that the universal nuclear family incorporates the four functions fundamental to human social life, the sexual, the economic, the reproductive, and the educational, i.e. that pertaining to socialization. For critiques of Mitchell's functionalism, see also Lands, Middleton, on the family and functionalist theory, see Beachy, Morgan, Vogel. End footnote. Even with its problems, easier to recognize at a distance of more than 15 years, Mitchell's 1966 article played an extremely positive role within the developing socialist feminist movement. Its differentiation of the content of women's lives into constituent categories helped women's liberationists to articulate their experience and begin to act on it. Its perceptive overview of the classical Marxist literature on women provided a base from which to confront both mechanical versions of Marxism and the growing influence of radical feminism. Its insistence, within a Marxist framework, on the critical importance of social phenomena not easily characterized as economic, anticipated the socialist feminist critique of economic determinism. And the political intelligence of its specific strategic comments sets a standard that remains a model. Quote, if socialism is to regain its status as the revolutionary politics, Mitchell concluded, it has to make good its practical sins of commission against women and its huge sin of omission, the absence of an adequate place for them in its theory. In the theoretical arena, Mitchell's central contribution was to legitimate a perspective that recognizes the ultimate primacy of economic phenomena, yet allows for the fact that other aspects of women's situation not only have importance, but may play key roles at certain junctures. By 1969, the North American Women's Liberation Movement had reached a high point of activity, its militancy complemented by a flourishing literature, published and unpublished. In this atmosphere, two Canadians, Margaret Benston and Peggy Morton, circulated and then published important essays. Each piece offered an analysis in Marxist terms of the nature of women's unpaid work within the family household and discussed its relationship to existing social contradictions and the possibilities for change. Footnote. Margaret Benston's article circulated under the title What Defines Women and was published as, quote, The Political Economy of Women's Liberation. Peggy Morton's original essay, A Woman's Work is Never Done, or the production, maintenance, and reproduction of labor power, was abridged in Leviathan in May 1970, and then revised for publication as A Woman's Work is Never Done. See Benston and Morton. End footnote. Benston starts from the problem of specifying the root of women's secondary status in capitalist society. She maintains that this root is economic, or material, and can be located in women's unpaid domestic labor. Women undertake a great deal of economic activity. They cook meals, sew buttons on garments, do laundry, care for children, and so forth. But the products and services that result from this work are consumed directly and never reach the marketplace. In Marxist terms, these products and services have use value, but no exchange value. For Benston, then, Women have a definite relationship to the means of production, one that is distinct from that of men. Women constitute the 
group of people who are responsible for the production of simple use values in those activities associated with the home and family. Hence, the family is an economic unit whose primary function is not consumption, as was generally held at the time by feminists, but production. Quote, the family should be seen primarily as a production unit for housework and child-rearing, end quote. Moreover, Benston argues, because women's unpaid domestic labor is technologically primitive and outside the money economy, each family household represents an essentially pre-industrial and pre-capitalist entity. While noting that women also participate in wage labor, she regards such production as transient and not central to women's definition as a group. It is women's responsibility for domestic work that provides the material basis for their oppression and enables the capitalist economy to treat them as a massive reserve army of labor. Equal access to jobs outside the home will remain a woefully insufficient precondition for women's liberation if domestic labor continues to be private and technologically backward. Benston's strategic suggestions, therefore, center on the need to provide a more important precondition by converting work now done in the home into public production. That is, society must move towards the socialization of housework and childcare. Quote, when such work is moved into the public sector, then the material basis for discrimination against women will be gone. End quote. In this way, Benson revives a traditional socialist theme, not as cliché, but as a forceful argument made in the context of a developing discussion within the contemporary women's movement. Peggy Morton's article, published in 1970, one year after Benston's, extended the analysis of the family household as a materially rooted social unit in capitalist society. For Morton, Benston's discussion of how unpaid household labor forms the material basis of women's oppression leaves open a number of questions. Do women form a class? Should women be organized only through their work in the household? How and why has the nature of the family as an economic institution in capitalist society changed? Morton sees the family, quote, as a unit whose function is the maintenance and reproduction of labor power, meaning that, quote, the task of the family is to maintain the present workforce and provide the next generation of workers, fitted with the skills and values necessary for them to be productive members of the workforce, end quote. Using this approach, Morton is able to tie her analysis of the family to the workings of the capitalist mode of production, and to focus on the contradictions experienced by working-class women within the family, in the labor force, and between the two roles. In particular, she shows that as members of the reserve army of labor, women are central, not peripheral, to the economy for they make possible the functioning of those manufacturing, service, and state sectors in which low wages are a priority. While the strategic outlook in the several versions of Morton's paper bears only a loose relationship to its analysis, and fluctuates from workers' control to revolutionary cadre building, her discussion of the contradictory tendencies in women's situation introduces a dynamic element that had been missing from Benston's approach. Both Benston's and Morton's articles have a certain simplicity that even at the time invited criticism. In the bright glare of hindsight, their grasp of Marxist theory and their ability to develop an argument appear painfully limited. Benston's facile dismissal of women's participation in wage labor requires correction, as Morton and others quickly pointed out. Moreover, her delineation of women's domestic labor as a remnant from pre-capitalist modes of production which had somehow survived into the capitalist present, cannot be sustained theoretically. Morton's position, while analytically more precise, glosses over the question of the special oppression of all women as a group, and threatens to convert the issue of women's oppression into a purely working-class concern. None of these problems should obscure, however, the theoretical advances made by Benston and Morton. Taken together, their two articles established the material character of women's unpaid domestic labor in the family household. 
each offered an analysis of the way this labor functioned as the material basis for the host of contradictions in women's experience in capitalist society. Morton, in addition, formulated the issues in terms of a concept of the reproduction of labor power, and emphasized the specific nature of contradictions within the working class. These theoretical insights had a lasting impact on subsequent socialist feminist work, and remain an important contribution. Moreover, they definitively shifted the framework for discussion of women's oppression. Where Mitchell had analyzed women's situation in terms of roles, functions, and structures, Benston and Morton focused on the issue of women's unpaid labor in the household and its relationship to the reproduction of labor power. In this sense, they located the problem of women's oppression in the theoretical terrain of materialism. An article by Maria Rosa Dalla Costa, published simultaneously in Italy and the United States in 1972, took the argument several steps further. Footnote. Maria Rosa Dalla Costa's article, Women and the Subversion of the Community, was published in Italian in 1972 and appeared simultaneously in English in Radical America. A corrected translation is found in Dalla Costa, 1973. End footnote. Agreeing that women constitute a distinct group whose oppression is based on the material character of unpaid household labor, Dalla Costa maintains that on a world level, all women are housewives. Whether or not a woman works outside the home, quote, it is precisely what is particular to domestic work, not only measured as numbers of hours and nature of work, but as quality of life and quality of relationships which it generates, that determines a woman's place wherever she is and to whichever class she belongs. End quote. At the same time, Dalla Costa concentrates her attention on the working class housewife, whom she sees as indispensable to capitalist production. As housewives, working class women find themselves excluded from capitalist production, isolated in routines of domestic labor that have the technological character of pre capitalist labor processes. Dalla Costa disputes the notion that these housewives are mere suppliers of use values in the home. Polemicizing against both traditional left views and the literature of the women's movement, she argues that housework only appears to be a personal service outside the arena of capitalist production. In reality, it produces not just use values for direct consumption in the family, but the essential commodity, labor power, the capacity of a worker to work. Indeed, she claims, housewives are exploited, productive workers, in the strict Marxist sense, for they produce surplus value. Appropriation of this surplus value is accomplished by the capitalist's payment of a wage to the working class husband, who thereby becomes the instrument of women's exploitation. The survival of the working class depends on the working class family, quote, but at the woman's expense against the class itself. The woman is the slave of a wage slave, and her slavery ensures the slavery of her man. And that is why the struggle of the woman of the working class against the family is crucial. End quote. Since working class housewives are productive laborers who are peculiarly excluded from the sphere of capitalist production, demystification of domestic work as a, quote, masked form of productive labor becomes a central task. Dalla Costa proposes two major strategic alternatives. First, socialize the struggle, not the work, of the isolated domestic laborer by mobilizing working-class housewives around community issues, the wagelessness of housework, the denial of sexuality, the separation of family from outside world, and the like. Quote, we must discover forms of struggle which immediately break the whole structure of domestic work, rejecting it absolutely, rejecting our role as housewives and the home as the ghetto of our existence. Since the problem is not only to stop doing this work, but to smash the entire role of housewife. End quote. Second, reject work altogether, especially in a capitalist economy, which increasingly draws women into the wage labor force. In opposition to the left's traditional view of this latter tendency as progressive, 
Della Costa maintains that the modern women's movement constitutes a rejection of this alternative. Economic independence achieved through, quote, performing social labor in a socialized structure is no more than a sham reform. Women have worked enough, and they must, quote, refuse the myth of liberation through work, end quote. The polemical energy and political range of Dalakosa's article had a substantial impact on the women's movement on both sides of the Atlantic. Unlike Benston, Morton, and other North American activists, Dalakosta seemed to have a sophisticated grasp of Marxist theory and socialist politics. Her arguments and strategic proposals struck a responsive chord in a movement already committed to viewing women's oppression, mainly in terms of their family situation. Few noticed that Dalla Costa, like Morton, talked only of the working class, and never specified the relationship between the oppression of working class housewives and that of all women. What was most important was that Dalla Costa, even more than Benston and Morton, seemed to have situated the question of women's oppression within an analysis of the role of their unpaid domestic labor in the reproduction of capitalist social relations. Moreover, since her article functioned as the theoretical foundation for a small but aggressive movement to demand wages for housework, which flourished briefly in the early 1970s, it acquired an overtly political role denied to most women's liberation theoretical efforts. Footnote. For a fine analysis of the campaign for wages for housework, see Malos, 1978. End footnote. Dalla Costa's vigorous insistence that, quote, housework as work is productive in the Marxian sense, that is, is producing surplus value, end quote, intensified a controversy already simmering within the socialist feminist movement. The discussion, which became known as the domestic labor debate, revolved around the theoretical status of women's unpaid domestic work and its product. Footnote. For useful recent summaries and critiques of the domestic labor debate, see Holstrom and Molyneux. Important early critiques include Freeman and Gerstein. End of footnote. Published contributions, usually appearing in British or North American left journals, established their particular positions by means of intricate arguments in Marxist economic theory, abstract, hard to follow, and in the atmosphere of the period, seemingly remote from practical application. With some justification, many in the women's movement regarded the debate as an obscure exercise in Marxist pedantry. Yet critical issues were at stake, even if they generally went unrecognized. In the first place, the domestic labor debate attempted to put into theoretical context the contemporary feminist insight that childbearing, childcare, and housework are material activities resulting in products, thus pointing to a materialist analysis of the basis for women's oppression. At the same time, the debate focused attention on the issues of women's position as housewives and of domestic labor's contribution to the reproduction of social relations. Various interpretations corresponded, more or less closely, to a variety of political and strategic perspectives on the relationship of women's oppression to class exploitation and to revolutionary struggle, although theorists rarely stated these implications clearly, leaving political and strategic issues unconfronted. Finally, and perhaps most consequential for the development of theory, the domestic labor debate employed categories drawn from capital, thereby displaying confidence that women's oppression could be analyzed within a Marxist framework. At issue in the domestic labor debate was the problem of how the commodity labor power gets produced and reproduced in capitalist societies. Differences arose over the precise meaning and application of Marxist categories in carrying out an analysis of this problem. In particular, discussion centered on the nature of the product of domestic labor, on its theoretical status as productive or unproductive labor, and on its relationship to the wage and to work done for wages. Many suggested, following Benston, that domestic labor produces use values, 
useful articles that satisfy human wants of some sort, for direct consumption within the household. The consumption of these use values enables family members to renew themselves and to return to work the next day. That is, it contributes to the overall maintenance and renewal of the working class. While various relationships were posited between this process of use-value production and capitalist production as a whole, the linkages remained somewhat vague. Others claimed, along with Dalla Costa, that domestic labor produces not just use-values, but the special commodity known as labor power. In this way, they seemed to tie women's unpaid household labor more tightly to the workings of the capitalist mode of production, a position that many found, at first encounter, very attractive. A particular position on the product of domestic labor naturally had some bearing, in the domestic labor debate, on the view taken of the theoretical character of that labor. The notion that domestic labor creates value as well as use value suggested to some, for example, that it could be categorized in Marxist terms as either productive or unproductive, meaning productive or unproductive of surplus value for the capitalist class. For those that argued that domestic labor only produces use values, no obvious Marxist category was at hand. Neither productive nor unproductive, domestic labor had to be something else. Most of the initial energy expended in the domestic labor debate focused on the question of whether domestic labor is productive or unproductive. Among those who followed the controversy, theoretical underdevelopment combined with a certain moralism and strategic opportunism to create a great deal of confusion. Again and again, the terms productive and unproductive, which Marx used as scientific economic categories, were invested with moral overtones. After all, to label women's work unproductive seemed uncharitable, if not downright sexist. Furthermore, the argument that unpaid labor in the household is productive suggested that women perform a certain amount of surplus labor, which is expropriated from them by men for the benefit of capital. In this sense, women could be said to be exploited, sex contradictions acquire a clear material basis, and housewives occupy the same strategic position in the class struggle as factory workers. For those wishing to reconcile commitments to both Marxism and feminism, this implication acted as a powerful magnet. Few participants in the women's movement or on the left had the theoretical and political ability to grasp, much less propose, a convincing alternative. Once the domestic labor debate was underway, the problem of the relationship between wages and domestic labor emerged as an issue. For Marx, the wage represents the value of the commodity labor power, a value that corresponds at any given historical moment to a socially established normal level of subsistence. Participants in the domestic labor debate pointed to difficulties created by Marx's formulation and asked a number of questions about the role of domestic labor and household structure in the establishment of the normal wage level. For example, it was not clear in Marx's work whether the normal wage covers individuals or the entire household supported by a worker. In addition, the functioning of the wage as a type of articulation between domestic labor and the capitalist mode of production required investigation. Those who viewed domestic labor as value-producing proposed that the wage is the vehicle by which the value produced by women and embodied in male wage workers' labor power, is transferred to the capitalist employer. Many also believed that women's unpaid domestic labor enables the capitalist class to pay less than the value of labor power, that is, less than the normal level of subsistence. Some suggested that a non-working wife cheapens the value of male labor power. Those who maintained that domestic labor produces use value, but not value, attempted to identify the role of domestic labor in the reproduction of labor power. Most participants in the debate also explored the possibility that certain tendencies imminent in capitalist development affect the performance of domestic labor and, therefore, wage levels. Several years after the domestic labor debate began, certain questions could be said to be settled. 
As it turned out, it was relatively easy to demonstrate theoretically that domestic labor in capitalist societies does not take the form of value-producing labor. Footnote. See Smith 1978, as well as Holstrom 1981, and Molyneux 1979. For a recent revival of interest in the issues raised by the domestic labor debate, see the essays collected in Fox 1980. End of footnote. Benston's original insight that domestic labor produces use values for direct consumption had been essentially correct. In the scientific sense, then, domestic labor cannot be either productive or unproductive, and women are not exploited as domestic laborers. At the same time, domestic labor is indispensable for the reproduction of capitalist social relations. Just what domestic labor is, rather than what it is not, remained a problem only superficially addressed by participants in the domestic labor debate. Some suggested it constitutes a separate mode of production, which is outside of the capitalist mode of production, but subordinate to it. Others implied domestic labor is simply a special form of work within the capitalist mode of production. Most left the question unanswered. The problem of specifying the character of domestic labor and issues concerning the wage and women's wage work now represent the central concerns of most theorists working with Marxist economic categories. As for politics and strategy, few today would use their analyses of the material foundation for women's oppression to draw easy conclusions about the role of women in revolutionary struggle. Benston, Morton, Dalla Costa, and the participants in the domestic labor debate set an important agenda for the study of women's position as housewives and the role of domestic labor in the reproduction of social relations. Their work proceeded, however, within severe limits which were not clearly identified. In the first place, they focused mainly on the capitalist mode of production. Second, they concentrated almost exclusively on domestic labor and women's oppression in the working class. Third, they generally restricted their analysis to the economic level. Fourth, they tended to identify domestic labor with housework and child care, leaving the status of childbearing undefined. Some of these limitations might have been defended as necessary steps in the development of a theoretical argument, but they rarely were. Although the discussion of domestic labor had been launched in response to the need for a materialist theory of women's oppression, its promise remained unfulfilled. In any case, by the mid-1970s, socialist feminist theorists were turning their attention to other questions. For example, the domestic labor debate shed little light on the problem of whether housework is analytically the same in different classes within capitalist society, and even less on the theoretical status of domestic labor in non-capitalist societies. Socialist feminists also turned their attention to the child-bearing and child-rearing components of domestic labor, and investigated the problem of why domestic labor generally falls to women. Since women's oppression is not specific to capitalist societies, furthermore, many wondered how to reconcile its particular contemporary character with the fact that women had been subordinated for thousands of years. Similarly, they asked whether women are liberated in socialist countries, and if not, what obstacles hold them back. Finally, the relationship between the material processes of domestic labor and the range of phenomena that make up women's oppression, especially those of an ideological and psychological nature, became a key issue. In general, these questions spoke more directly than the issues of the domestic labor debate to the experience and political tasks of activists in the women's movement, and they quickly became the focus of socialist feminist theorizing. While Juliet Mitchell had advised that, quote, we should ask the feminist questions, but try to come up with some Marxist answers, many socialist feminists began to disagree. They argued that the quest for Marxist answers to their questions led down a blind alley where the feminist struggle became submerged in the socialist struggle against capitalism. Marxist theory, they believed, was incapable of incorporating the phenomenon of sex differences. To move forward, then, socialist feminism had to take on the task of constructing an alternative framework 
using other theoretical categories. As Heidi Hartman put it, quote, If we think Marxism alone inadequate, and radical feminism itself insufficient, then we need to develop new categories. End quote. Socialist feminists turned first to the radical feminism of the late 60s for a conceptual orientation that could address the depth and pervasiveness of women's oppression in all societies. Radical feminists typically considered male supremacy and the struggle between the sexes to be universal, constituting indeed the essential dynamic underlying all social development. At the same time, some radical feminist writings seem to be extensions or deepenings of the insights offered by Marx and Engels. Shulamith Firestone's Dialectic of Sex, for instance, claimed to go beyond the merely economic level addressed by Marx and Engels. In order to uncover the more fundamental problem of sex oppression, quote, The class analysis is a beautiful piece of work, Firestone wrote, but limited. In proposing a dialectic of sex, she hoped, quote, to take the class analysis one step further to its roots in the biological division of the sexes. We have not thrown out the insights of the socialists. On the contrary, radical feminism can enlarge their analysis, granting it an even deeper basis in objective conditions, and thereby explaining many of its insolubles, end quote. Similarly, Kate Millett's Sexual Politics, acknowledged Engels as a major theorist, but her presentation of Engels' work transformed it almost beyond recognition into a subordinate contribution to what she called the sexual revolution. The limitation of Marxist theory, she maintained, was that it, quote, failed to supply a sufficient ideological base for a sexual revolution, and was remarkably naive as to the historical and psychological strength of patriarchy, end quote. In broad strokes, Millet depicted Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and Freudian psychology as comparable instances of reactionary patriarchal policy and ideology, arguing that patriarchy will survive so long as psychic structures remain untouched by social programs. For Millet, the sexual revolution requires not only an understanding of sexual politics, but the development of a comprehensive theory of patriarchy. Firestone's and Millet's books, both published in 1970, had a tremendous impact on the emerging socialist feminist trend within the women's movement. Their focus on sexuality, on psychological and ideological phenomena, and on the stubborn persistence of social practices oppressive to women, struck a responsive chord. The concept of patriarchy entered socialist feminist discourse virtually without objection. Those few critiques framed within a more Marxist perspective, such as Juliet Mitchell's, went unheard. Although acknowledging the limitations of radical feminism, many socialist feminists, particularly in the United States, simply assumed that, quote, the synthesis of radical feminism and Marxist analysis is a necessary first step in formulating a cohesive socialist feminist political theory one that does not merely add together these two theories of power, but sees them as interrelated through the sexual division of labor. End quote. No longer was the problem one of using Marxist categories to build a theoretical framework for the analysis of women's oppression. Like the radical feminists, these socialist feminists took Marxism more or less as a given, and did not seek to elaborate or deepen it. The task, then, was to develop the synthesis that is socialist feminism, or, as one writer put it, to dissolve the hyphen. To accomplish this task, socialist feminists explored two related concepts, patriarchy and reproduction. The notion of patriarchy, taken over from radical feminism, required appropriate transformation. Millet had used the term to indicate a universal system of political, economic, ideological, and above all, psychological, structures through which men subordinate women. Socialist feminists had to develop a concept of patriarchy capable of being linked with the theory of class struggle, which posits each mode of production as a specific system of structures through which one class exploits and subordinates another. 
In general, socialist feminists suggested, as Heidi Hartman and Amy Bridges put it, that, quote, Marxist categories, like capital itself, are sex-blind. The categories of patriarchy as used by radical feminists are blind to history, end quote. From this point of view, the concept of patriarchy provided a means for discussing social phenomena that seemed to escape Marxist categories. Some suggested that a theory of patriarchy could explain why certain individuals, men as well as women, are in particular subordinate or dominant places within the social structure of a given society. Others believed that issues of interpersonal dominance and subordination could best be addressed by a theory of patriarchy. Socialist feminist theorists were not in agreement, moreover, on the meaning of the concept of patriarchy. For some, it represented a primarily ideological force or system. Many argued that it has a major material foundation in the ability of men to control women's labor, access to resources, and sexuality. Patriarchal authority, wrote Sheila Robotham, for example, is based on male control over the women's productive capacity and over her person. Different approaches emerged also to the problems of the origin of the divisions of labor by sex, and of the relationship between patriarchy and the workings of a particular mode of production. Footnote. On dissolving the hyphen, Pachesky. Early and influential socialist feminist discussions of patriarchy include Hartman and Bridges, Kelly Gadol, Rubin. End footnote. The concept of reproduction was invoked as a means of linking theoretically women's oppression and the Marxist analysis of production and the class struggle. Socialist feminist theorists analyzed processes of reproduction as comparable to, but relatively autonomous from, the production that characterizes a given society. Often they talked in terms of a mode of reproduction, analogous to the mode of production. As with the concept of patriarchy, there was little agreement on the substantive meaning of the term reproduction. Some simply identified reproduction with what appear to be the obvious functions of the family. Despite the empiricism of this approach, it clarified the analytical tasks that socialist feminists confronted. In Renata Breidenthal's words, quote, The relationship between production and reproduction is a dialectic within a larger historical dialectic. That is, changes in the mode of production give rise to changes in the mode of reproduction, end quote, and that this dialectic must be analyzed. Several participants in the domestic labor debate postulated the existence of a, quote, housework or family mode of production alongside the capitalist mode of production, but subordinate to it. The concept of a mode of production converged, moreover, with suggestions by Marxist anthropologists that families act as a perpetual source of cheap labor power in both third world and advanced capitalist countries. A similar concept of the mode of reproduction was often implicit in the work of socialist feminists who studied the relationship between imperialism and the family. Recent socialist feminist discussion has challenged the use of the notions of patriarchy and reproduction, arguing that existing theoretical efforts have failed to develop satisfactory ways of conceptualizing either. In the first place, neither patriarchy nor reproduction has been defined with any consistency. The concept of patriarchy often remains embedded in its radical feminist origins as an essentially ideological and psychological system. Where it is used in a more materialist sense, it has not been adequately integrated into a Marxist account of productive relations. Problems in defining the concept of reproduction derive from its wide range of potential meanings. Felicity Edholm, Olivia Harris, and Kate Young suggest that three levels of analysis might be distinguished. Social reproduction, or the reproduction of the conditions of production, reproduction of the labor force, and human or biological reproduction. While the suggestion has been helpful, the issue of the relationship among the different aspects remains. A second theme in recent critiques is the problem of dualism. 
again and again, theorists using the concepts of patriarchy and reproduction, analyze women's oppression in terms of two separate structures, for example, capitalism and patriarchy, the mode of production and the mode of reproduction, the class system and the gender system. These quote, dual systems theories, as Ira's Young terms them, imply that, quote, women's oppression arises from two distinct and relatively autonomous systems, end quote. Because they fail to relate the systems in a coherent, non-mechanical way, dual systems theories present a mysterious coexistence of disjunct explanations of social development. The duality generally recapitulates the opposition between feminism and Marxism that socialist feminist theory had attempted to transcend. Veronica Beachy argues, for instance, that, quote, the separation of reproduction or patriarchy from other aspects of the mode of production has tended to leave the Marxist analysis of production untouched and uncriticized by feminist thinking, end quote. Similarly, Young suggests that, quote, dual systems theory has not succeeded in confronting and revising traditional Marxist theory enough because it allows Marxism to retain, in basically unchanged form, its theory of economic and social relations, to which it merely graphs on a theory of gender relations. End quote. Furthermore, the problem is not just dualism. Socialist feminist theory has focused on the relationship between feminism and socialism, and between sex and class oppression, largely to the exclusion of issues of racial, or national oppression. At most, sex, race, and class are described as comparable sources of oppression, whose parallel manifestations harm their victims more or less equally. Strategically, socialist feminists call for sisterhood and a women's movement that unites women from all sectors of society. Nonetheless, their sisters of color often express distrust of the contemporary women's movement and generally remain committed to activity in their own communities. The socialist feminist movement has been unable to confront this phenomenon, either theoretically or practically. In short, despite the vitality of debate, socialist feminist theorists have not yet been able to achieve their goal of developing a unified, dialectical materialist perspective on women's liberation. End of chapter.